Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Thursday, everybody. Let's continue with our coverage of China's opening up and the massive first wave outbreak surging across the country, smashing against China's healthcare and economic systems. Yesterday, Wednesday, at a WHO end-of-year press conference, Director General Tedros expressed that his organization is quote very concerned end quote about the spike in severe COVID-19 cases in China, adding that it wanted more data. To be made available on disease severity, hospital admissions, and occupancy rates at intensive care units. Others expressed points which we have already thoroughly covered here on China Update. Quote, What's being reported is relatively low numbers of cases in hospitals and ICU, but anecdotally there are reports that those ICUs are filling up; they are behind the curve. End quote. Ryan observed that China quote lags behind in vaccination rates end quote as well, and quote the question remains whether or not enough vaccination can be done in the coming week or two weeks that will actually blunt the impact of the Omicron wave. End quote, adding that the WHO would encourage China to import foreign mRNA vaccines on the ground in China, facing this wave of outbreaks, competing policy objectives are causing confusion and messy policy implementation. We remember that Beijing recently okayed a government-subsidized loan scheme for equipment upgrades at local hospitals across the country to allow those medical centers to rapidly increase their facilities for weathering the growing COVID storm. Hospitals had until the end of the year to apply for these loans. However, both domestic and international analysts have discovered that as As of this week, many of these cash-strapped and grossly under-equipped hospitals are refusing to take the loans. Why? Well, because these last few years, the fiscal health of many local hospitals, as well as the local governments that, in practice, support them, were devastated due to the demands of zero COVID policies. So now, many of these hospitals simply do not want to borrow any more money, even if subsidized. And even in localities where life-saving equipment and facilities are needed, many are worried they will struggle to pay off even low-interest debt. Quote, We have suffered a slump in revenue in recent years as the zero COVID policy prevented patients of other diseases from seeing doctors. We don't have any incentive to buy new devices. End quote. One Shanghai-based ultrasound equipment manufacturer told the UK-based Financial Times that he estimates that the Chinese healthcare system's annual income has fallen one third since zero COVID began in 2020. Hospital officials understand that ultimately local governments can bail them out, but they also understand that in many localities, the fiscal conditions of many local governments themselves have also been devastated these last few years. On this point, we will be discussing China's. Record public fiscal deficit later in the video. The fact that the cost of zero COVID to some hospitals has now, to some extent, disincentivized the preparations for COVID infections is darkly and sadly ironic. And this policy priority clash, that is between managing China's first COVID wave and fiscal discipline, reminds us of Professor Pei's argument from earlier this week. That China's system tends to be very good at pursuing a single tough policy objective, while policy multitasking with incremental trade-offs are typically less well performed. We should note that not every hospital turned down the loans. Indeed, many wealthy regions where fiscal conditions are healthier, relatively speaking, took advantage of the program. An official at the China Association of Medical Equipment, speaking to Chinese financial media outlet Yitai, said that in coastal Fujian Province, the provincial government required every county hospital to apply for at least 100 million RMB of subsidized loans. But even here, we see unintended consequences. It would appear that the subsidized loans are being disproportionately enjoyed by the wealthiest regions of the country, which have the debt servicing capacity to take them on. While the poorest regions, for which the loan program was primarily intended, and where equipment purchases would likely see the biggest utility gains, cannot afford them. Meanwhile, multiple reports suggest that local governments across China have begun requisitioning from private factories key products for fighting COVID from 
ibuprofen to COVID-19 testing kits, cutting the line in front of private orders. Quote, it's a desperate situation, but it's every man for themselves. We waited so long for the unbundling of COVID controls, but the relaxation was so sudden that local governments, health systems, and companies in the supply chain were not prepared. End quote. While one could argue that, in the short term at least, this is for the greater public good and will prevent things like price gouging and hoarding, etc., economists from the classical liberal school of thought would probably warn that if the state requisitions goods at a price below where it would be under free market conditions, it can risk shortages of the products themselves as capital is scared away. The requisitions have also meant that in the short term, public bodies, hospitals, universities, government offices, SOEs, etc., have greater access to COVID products, while the private sector actors, like pharmacies, which arguably have more efficient and responsive logistics and distribution chains, are almost entirely without. Indeed, as we have already seen, many pharmacies, even in wealthy cities, have completely sold out of key products, including medication. Meanwhile, local Chinese media reports that this week, Chinese officials in some cities have responded to labor shortage issues from surging COVID cases by simply demanding that infected workers with mild symptoms go back to work. A utilitarian argument can be made for asking infected doctors and medical staff to remain on in hospitals, but these directives are for office workers in places like Chongqing and factory workers in Zhejiang. We should avoid exaggeration as we look at these reports though. Those with serious symptoms are still allowed to rest, and it appears that the directives are more intended to permit employers to let COVID-positive employees return to workspaces. Yet another sign of China learning to live with the virus. Still though, with strong social pressures and in some industries, weak labor rights protections, there will be no small number of sick workers in need of rest, prematurely having to return to work. Hey guys, if you're enjoying today's episode of China Update, don't forget to hit that like button. And for the 50% of viewers who are currently not subscribed to China Update, if you do like this sort of content and you would like to help the channel, just subscribing and hitting the bell notification is a big help. And as always, anyone who wants to go that extra mile and help me keep the channel sustainable and primarily subscriber supported, so China Update does not need to rely on corporate sponsorship, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. China's broad budget deficit has hit a new record so far this year, underscoring just how bad the economy was at the end of November. While this is disquieting, it is not at all surprising. We knew that zero COVID and the housing crisis has been hitting local and national government coffers hard this year. According to Bloomberg calculations based on the official data, the augmented fiscal deficit was 7.75 trillion RMB, 1.1 trillion US dollars, in January to November. Analysts with Bloomberg point out that that was more than double the same period last year and larger than all of 2020, when the economy was battered by the initial COVID outbreak and growth was the slowest in decades. This reinforces our point from yesterday's video that Chinese growth was in part maintained this year through debt, finance, public spending, and thus deficits. For those viewers who on occasion say in the comments, you speak of economic damage, where is it? The economy is still growing, isn't it? Well, here we are looking at part of that damage. Not all damage is measured in terms of reduced GDP. Due to COVID, many governments around the world saw hits to fiscal health, surges in debt, and a year of record deficit. China, however, has now seen three years of it. Total income from the general public and government fund budgets in the first 11 months of this year are down 3% year on year, a slowdown from the 4.5% drop in the first 10 months of this year. We remember that tax cuts, a critical part of Beijing's efforts to stimulate the economy to very mixed success, have dealt a blow to fiscal income too. The other is the sale of land use rights. In November, revenue from these land use rights sales increased versus October, but year to year are still down 13%. 
Total government spending in the first 11 months was up 6.2% year-on-year. Ministry of Finance data published yesterday showed government health care spending surged 15% in the first 11 months of this year as the authority invested heavily in PRC testing and centralized quarantine facilities. As we have discussed this week, if 2023 sees a bumper year in economic growth, this will likely take some pressure off China's fiscal situation. However, for the rest of this decade, stubborn deficits could well be added to China's list of medium to long term, deep systemic challenges. And indeed, as is the case for any issue, systemic in nature makes resolving the other challenges just that much more difficult. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. I'm sorry about <coughs> losing my voice near the end there. My apologies. Hope you're having a great day wherever you are. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. I will see you all tomorrow.